this morning, we're going to be talking about the Exodus motif of marriage in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is part three. Uh, it's just one of the important um, aspects of it that needs to be brought out, especially as we've connected it to uh, the Exodus. And I think I was looking this morning and I saw some uh, great material, another uh, person who had uh, talked about the Passover and the Lamb. And or the Passover lamb and the Exodus. So I'm looking forward to getting my hands on that material just to read it and see what's there. But uh, we're delighted to see you all here. Uh, good morning, Marlena, Eric, and Julie, and Robin. It's good to see all of you and those of you who will be joining a little bit later. So let's go ahead and get underway. Uh, last week, we talked in some detail about the relationship of the marriage covenant uh, that God had with Israel during the time of the Exodus. And we cited texts from Exodus chapter 19, where he said that he was going to, um, or that they would be a kingdom of priests to him, and that uh, everything that, or well, they said everything that he had required of them, they would do, which indicated that they were entering into this uh, covenant relationship with him. And according to Jeremiah chapter 31, and verses 31 and 32, it says that this was a um, marriage covenant. We also demonstrated that from Ezekiel chapter 16 as well. And then we cite a text from Isaiah chapter 61, chapter 62, and we might have given one from Isaiah 60 as well, but also Hosea chapter 2 that demonstrated this betrothal uh, concept. Uh, furthermore, we demonstrated the interrelationship of the concept of sowing or the planting of the Lord in order to raise up trees of righteousness and suggested to you that that is the same planting that is referred to in the book of first, uh, excuse me, Romans. I keep wanting to say first Corinthians 15, but in Romans chapter six, it is also there by the way, which is what we're talking about. But it uh, is here in Romans chapter six, as we have been discussing uh, for some time, because this is also uh, the foundation for resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. But in Romans chapter 6, when he says in verse 5, for we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. And we pointed out that there are some translations that even use the word uh, planted, uh, at least in the English uh, translation, uh, because it's the same uh, idea, it's the same concept. And basically what you had was, you know, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, that which you sow is not made alive unless it dies. So what you had were people who were alive to sin, and they were placed in a sphere where death could occur, meaning in Christ, dying to their sins, and therefore were raised up to live in righteousness. However, that righteousness was projected toward the consummation, toward the time of the end, and that's why we have those concepts of should walk in newness of life and shall um, be in the likeness of his resurrection. And we've, we've discussed that quite often in the text. And so when we encounter the sowing in 1 Corinthians 15, it is connected to the Exodus because it likewise is referring to uh, the period in which they were sown and the period in which they were raised, uh, meaning they came out of the bondage of the uh, Egyptian uh, uh, captivity and then, and, and slavery, and then they were carried into, or um, they entered into the land, uh, which was resurrection, but that was also the marriage covenant. Now, in Romans 7, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, we have this theme carried through. So Romans 7 is actually just a recapitulation, if you please, of Romans chapter 6. It's just stated in a different way, but it brings in the concept of marriage, but Paul has not ceased to talk about the very same thing that he was talking about before. Um, when you look in the text, you can see that um, this is the same subject introduced from chapters 5 and 6. He spoke to those who knew the law, and he had just spoken of being set free from sin to become slaves of righteousness. So it's important that we see that the beginning of chapter 6 dealt with uh, the release from sin, because he says, how shall we who die to sin live any longer therein? And therefore they die to it in order to rise in righteousness. And you see the same thing at the end of the chapter. So that's um, the um, concept in verse 22 and 23 
uh, to show this girl, like, you know, I always forget this word every time I think about this, this concept. Um, inclusio, that's what it is. It's an inclusio. And, and so you have the introduction of the concept of sin in the beginning of the chapter, and you have the chapter closing with that, uh, as far as this uh, part goes. And I pointed that out in the book of 1 Corinthians, because you have the Bible saying Christ died for our sins. And then at the very end of the chapter, you have him talking about the sting of death is sin and the strength of, of sin is the law. So it's an inclusio there as well. But nevertheless, that being the case, that helps us to understand what's going on when we enter into the next chapter. Good morning to you, Cunny and Ron uh, as well. So he says, but now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life and more literally life of the age. Uh, we are so accustomed to using the phrase phraseology, eternal life or everlasting life, but more literally in the Greek, it's the life of the age, because the age in which they were living could not produce life. That's why Galatians 3 and verse 21 says, for if there had been a law which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And I always love to point out the fact that life and righteousness are interchanged in that text. So you can see just what life is all about. It was righteousness. And that's pointed out both here in Romans 6 as well in, as in 1 Corinthians 15. So he says the wages of sin is death. That was the end result of sin. It was death in the age. And then you have the wages uh, or the gift of God is eternal life or life of the age. So those stand in contrast, they are eschatological uh, results and eschatological goals that would be the result of the choice that one made to live, whether it was under the ministration of death or under the ministration of life. So when he goes into chapter 7, he says, or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Now notice, this concept of bearing fruit was mentioned in Romans 6 and verse 22, when they became slaves of God. That means that's also when they entered this new uh, marriage covenant, uh, and therefore became slaves of God. And he says that we should bear fruit to God in Romans 7. So you can see, therefore, that it is the same subject matter that's going on. It's just being spoken of in a different figure. And therefore, the Exodus motif is also the marriage motif. And since 1 Corinthians 15 is dealing with the Passover and Christ as our Passover lamb, um, that demonstrates that it's an Exodus motif and therefore a marriage motif as well. And so I hope we've made that point. Uh, very um, clearly to you and that we understand it. So uh, he is saying that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now remember in Romans 6 and verse 14, the scripture says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And that means to be free from the law was to be free from the sin. And thus they were married to the sin and therefore die to the sin through this new marriage that uh, they contracted or covenanted through and with Christ. Thus, um, we have this illustration of the wife and the husband. And so uh, this relationship of the wife and the husband in saying that the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband so then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if the husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she is married another man. So dying to the sin, that is to their former husband, 
that enabled him to be free to remarry. To die to the former husband means the former husband was dead to them, and the husband could could um, yet be living. But if they died to him, in other words, the law was still going on. A lot of people think that in the context that it is the law that died, and that is far removed from what Paul is saying. That's why he told them in Romans six fourteen. He says um, the sin, or rather, sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. They couldn't be under a law that did not exist. And even in the statement that opens the chapter, when he says, what shall we continue in the sin that the grace be abound? And it was the law that gave strength to sin. And so he is showing them that it wasn't the law that ended. It was the relationship to the law through their dying with Christ, according to Romans chapter 6. That is the important point that needs to be understood. And so those who come to us telling us that the law ceased or died in um, uh, AD 30 at the time that Jesus died on the cross, and some even say when he said it is finished, even though things weren't finished, and even though they recognize that their eschatology has to be based on the law, according to Acts chapter 24, 15, Matthew 5, 18, etc., uh, they run into serious problems trying to say that the law was fulfilled at the cross, but it just will not uh, work. It just doesn't uh, compute as far as the Bible is concerned. No, they had to die to that relationship. You see, the Jews were very well aware of the need and of that process of dying to something in order for them to be enter or to enter into a new relationship. And, and so that is what the text is all about. It was only because they died in Christ that they were freed from their former situation, which enabled them to enter into the marriage. Now, note also that in this context, good morning to you, Tiffany. In this context, the scripture doesn't say that they were married. It says that they should be married. There's your same subjunctive mood used here in Romans 7, 4, that was used over in uh, first, excuse me, Romans chapter 6 verses four and five. So in one where he says that you should walk in newness of life, and, and as I said, we've talked about that. Well, he says that you should be married. So what does he mean? They have entered into this covenant relationship, but if you recall the statements in Hosea chapter two, where he says, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. In other words, they had entered the betrothal, and the betrothal is that which precedes the marriage. It's just like Joseph and Mary in Matthew chapter 1, when it says the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, before they consummated that betrothal in the marriage relationship. Well, the same thing was true with the church, because in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and the verse is 2, Paul makes this statement regarding the church. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the church was going to be presented to Christ at the time of the fulfillment of all things. The relationship that the church had prior to that was a relationship of betrothal. And of course, the uh, relationship that consummated the marriage was something that came after the betrothal, but it was all one, uh, one process uh, in terms of it. And this is why um, once they had entered into that betrothal, a divorce was required in order to terminate that relationship, which is what Joseph had intended until he found out that Mary uh, had been impregnated by the Holy Spirit and therefore had not uh, sinned against him in that relationship. So when we go to, for example, Ephesians, Ephesians talks about this presentation of the bride in Ephesians chapter 5. And shows us once again that it is the consummating or the consummation of that relationship uh, that began in what the Bible calls the betrothal. And so he says in verse um, 
25, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Well, the time of this presenting the church to Christ is the parousia, is the coming of the Lord. And how can we separate the coming of the Lord in Ephesians 5 from the coming of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 15? We cannot. Therefore, the coming of the Lord in 1 Corinthians 15 is the consummation of the marriage. And therefore, it continues to follow the Exodus motif, motif regarding marriage from that point of view. So it's very, very uh, important that we see this. And so in Romans 7, 4, as I read it again for you, the text says, therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another. That's the subjunctive there, that you may be, which indicates probable action in the future to him who was raised from the dead. And so when you read Matthew 25, and it says the kingdom of heaven is as um, 10 virgins who go out to meet the bridegroom, etc. That point of the coming was future. John 14, also, when it talks about uh, the Father's house, etc., that's, uh, that's wedding terminology. It takes place at the parousia, and that's why he's saying that you may be married to another, so it was a process that was going on to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law we're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. That's a reiteration of what we discussed in Romans 6. But now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. That's about as much as I want to uh, cover on that part, uh, just showing you the correlations between Romans chapter 6 and Romans 7, as they have the continuity of that same theme and motif running through it, but that forms the basis of what we have in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 15 in terms of that relationship with, uh, with the law. Now, the next thing is 1 Corinthians 15 is about the annulling of the covenant of death and Sheol. That's why in the latter part of the chapter, when he says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? And also, even before you get there, when you read 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 26, uh, the text is not saying that this is the end of death or that death was already abolished. It was saying that death is being abolished. You, I, I suggest that you go to BibleHub.com plug in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, pull up the, or click on the interlinear, and then look at the tense of the verb there. I don't think I noted it, but it's, it's either a present passive or present middle, uh, indicating that death was being annulled at that very time when 1 Corinthians 15 was written. And you see, that indicates the process of dying to the law. It indicates the process of dying to sin. And it indicates the process of becoming alive to God or the completing of this marriage relationship, which has to take place when death was completely removed. Because remember, uh, they had to die to that old system of law in order to be married to Christ. And that's why also when we covered Romans 6, we talked about the statement that says, reckon yourselves to be indeed dead unto sin. So it was that process that was going on. Good morning to you, Terry and Beatrice. Now, we're going to look, therefore, at the timing of the marriage so that we are clear on the correlation between the Exodus and 1 Corinthians 15, uh, which is the antitype of the Exodus. Again, the marriage situation, the marriage covenant in the Exodus underlies everything we read about in 1 Corinthians 15, because both were dealing with a release from sin. So if we understand 1 Corinthians 15 is the Exodus motif, and if we understand that the Exodus was a 40-year 
process. And I don't think anybody could doubt that. But just in case there is some doubt out there uh, among some or those who may not be uh, familiar with this information, I know we have a lot of people who are, but let's take a look at um, Hebrews chapter 3. Beginning at verse 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my way. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So it was a 40-year period. Uh, just like Micah 7.15 says, as in the days of your coming out of Egypt, I will show these wonders. And then again, you can see from Acts chapter 7, and the verse is 36, he mentions uh, the timing that these wonders were shown again. And I think it's important to even read this particular text because he says in verse 35, this Moses whom they rejected saying, who made you a ruler? and a judge is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. So these signs were shown in Egypt when they performed these miracles regarding the, um, the plagues. They were shown in the Red Sea when Moses parted it and they walked through on dry land. And they were shown in the wilderness when he fed them with manna from heaven and water out of the rock, etc., that encompassed the 40 years of their deliverance out of Egypt. And so this is what we're dealing with in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians when we talk about the uh, type and the anti-type. So if we understand that the Exodus motif involved a marriage covenant with Yahweh, then it must logically follow that the marriage covenant was a 40-year process. Now, I've already talked about the presentation of the bride at the parousia in Ephesians 5, in Matthew 25, and in all other passages, as we'll see noted here, if that is the case, and if we talk about resurrection at the parousia, then it has to be resurrection at the time of the consummation of the marriage covenant, which is a 40-year process. And therefore, 1 Corinthians 15 cannot be pushed, it cannot be forced, it cannot be pulled. Any kind of way you want to manipulate it, you cannot take it out of the perspective of that first century framework, and therefore it reached its fulfillment in the time that was the framework of the Exodus. So very, very important, and that just castrates the physical future resurrection view that people have taught in the scripture. It just doesn't work. Now, if 1 Corinthians, therefore, is based on that framework of the 40 years Exodus, and it is about the resurrection, then the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 is a 40-year event. There is one event that precedes marriage in scripture. Now, this is how we will prove to you that it could not extend beyond that 40-year period. And this is what's very important. So once we identify that marriage is a part of that relationship and, and a part of the context of 1 Corinthians 15, and it has been a part of the context of the Passover and the deliverance from sin. This is why we need to get it right when we start in the chapter and we have the applied meaning of Jesus' death is dying for our sins and not dying for our physical bodies. When we get that meaning correct, and we understand that that's the Passover lamb, and it's the Exodus motif from start to finish, then we have the marriage. But what is it in Scripture that lets us know precisely when this occurs? It is apparent in every single marriage text uh, or major marriage text in the Scripture. So let's follow those. Um, first of all, in Matthew chapter 22, you will see that it follows the destruction of the city, the destruction of the city. There's no way you can get around that. So let's read. In verse 1 of Matthew chapter 22, the Bible says, And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. 
And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business, and the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. There's the persecution that started. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. So we have to have the destruction of a city between the time of the invitation to the marriage and the consummation of the marriage. The Bible says in verse 8, then he said to his servants, after he has burned the city, after he has burned the city, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, as many of you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways, gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, all, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. And so here is the destruction of the city and the wedding that follows, and we submit to you that that is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That was a 40-year period uh, from the time of Jesus' announcing of this process and of his dying. And therefore, we have the destruction of the city uh, that marks the time of the wedding. Good morning to you, uh, Yvette. And following that, we have Matthew chapter 24. You have the same relationship of the destruction of a city in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 that we had in Matthew chapter 22. Now, Matthew 24 is a continuation of a message that Jesus had begun as early as chapter 20, uh, 23, 22, actually. But let's just start with chapter 23. Ignore those chapter divisions from 23, 24, and 25, and you'll see that it's one continuous narrative in terms of what Christ uh, was teaching. And so in Matthew 24 and verse 3, after he had spoken about all the stones of the temple, that one would not uh, be left upon another. The disciples came to him privately and asked him the question, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your parousia, of your coming? That's the same word used in 1 Corinthians 15. And of the completion of the age. And of the completion of the age. And he goes on to give them the signs throughout the book of Matthew. And we have so many people have a problem with those, but Jesus said they all would happen in that generation. But as we continue reading in Matthew 24, all the way through to Matthew 25, what's the next thing? Now, everybody knows that Matthew 24 is about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. I had a, uh, just this past week, had a conversation with Hebrew Israelites. And they admitted in Luke chapter 21, as a matter of fact, they pulled the text first to talk about it. Luke 21, 20 through 22, that says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And he says, well, that was the destruction of Jerusalem. That happened in 70 AD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, exactly. That's correct. It's the destruction of the city by the Romans, just like those armies in Matthew 22. However, as you continue to read and understand there is no chapter division, that we're dealing with the same topic. And the very next thing that is mentioned is the time of the wedding. As a matter of fact, there's wedding terminology, even in Matthew 24, for example, verse 31, when it talks about gathering together his uh, elect with the sound of a trumpet, that is the feast of trumpets. It's also the wedding feast. So it's already mentioned, and it's before verse 34. So he's telling you that the wedding would take place before that generation passed away. And that harmonizes with the Exodus motif, showing you that it's the destruction of a city, the destruction of Jerusalem, that would precede the marriage at the time of the parousia. And that is precisely what you have in Matthew chapter 24. Then we have the book of Ephesians. 
In Ephesians, I've already alluded to it in chapter 5, but where's the war and where's the uh, city being destroyed in Ephesians? Well, this one may be a little bit more uh, difficult for people to find. But if we turn to the sixth chapter of Ephesians, and one thing we will note there is a war that's going on. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, verses 11 and 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness. Now watch, of this age. What age was that? It was the age of Moses in which they were still still living. It was the against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the heavenlies. Now, when you note the book of Revelation, you will note that the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches in Asia, one of which was the church at Ephesus, and thus the message in Revelation would apply to the church at Ephesus. But what was going on in the book of Revelation in chapter 12? You have this war between Satan and his angels and Michael and his angels. So let's take a look at that and let's see what happens. The Bible says in verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who's, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and the angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brother who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Now, when you look at that and you see that after this war came salvation and power and um, the kingdom of God, that takes you back to Matthew 25 and the coming of the kingdom, takes you to 1 Corinthians 15 and the coming of the kingdom. And it takes you to other passages as well and the coming of the kingdom. So there you have the same situation. You have the, the parousia that follows this um, point, uh, 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 this destruction of Satan, in other words, being cast out and the time of the kingdom. But you can see that in Revelation chapter um, 18 and or actually 19, 1 and 2, because the um, casting out was the time of the casting out of Babylon. And I'll say more about that in a moment, uh, because that is another of the uh, points that need to be made when we talk about that. And, and it's interesting, when you look in Revelation chapter 12, uh, it points out the fact that the woman was given, in verse 14, it says, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly, notice, into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time, times, and a half time from the presence of the serpent. That was the time also that uh, the city of Jerusalem was being destroyed. It was a time, times, and a half time. That takes you back to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. Uh, also, Daniel chapter 7 as well when that uh, term is used. And also Revelation 11 and verse 2 where it says the holy city would be trodden down for 40 and 2 months. That's the time, times, and a half a time. So you can see the destruction of that city. Remember back in the Exodus, when God told Moses to take Israel into the wilderness, that they may worship him? So that's the same idea. It's the same Exodus motif that you have here. Now, I know I'm out of time, and I'm running, um, uh, you know, very quickly uh, out of time in order to finish this, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, add this concept in so we can see this time uh, related to the destruction of the city. And so the next one will take us to uh, Revelation 19, which I was about to do a moment ago, but let's look at Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2. Now, chapters 17 and 18 talk about the destruction of Babylon, Mystery Babylon the Great, that was burned and destroyed. You see um, this in Revelation 17 and verse 16. It says, In the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate, and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her flesh, or burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, the great city is mentioned in Revelation 11 and verse 8, because the Bible says that their dead bodies would lie in the street of the great city, 
which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. That couldn't be America. It couldn't be Rome because Jesus was not crucified in either. He was crucified in Jerusalem, Luke chapter 24, also in Hebrews chapter 13, and many other passages in the New Testament. But uh, that being the case, it was the destruction of the great city, who was called Mystery Babylon. So here's what happens. In Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2, after these things, I heard a loud voice um, of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power belongs to the Lord. That's the parallel to that text that we just read in uh, Revelation chapter 12, that after this war came the power and the kingdom and the salvation of the Lord that was mentioned in that text. And so now he shows you the same thing again, but it is after Babylon has been destroyed, which is also the time of the defeat of Satan, by the way. So he says, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged the blood of his servants shed by her. Remember, Jesus said that when Jerusalem was destroyed, that that would be the vengeance for the blood of all the righteous from the blood of uh, righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom they murdered between the temple and the altar. And he says all those things would come upon this generation, meaning the generation living at that time, meaning his generation, which puts it right back into that 40-year time frame. And here again, we see that it is after that, that uh, Mystery Babylon is destroyed, that vengeance has been carried out on the great city. Therefore, the great city is Jerusalem. But what happened when Jerusalem was destroyed? We've already shown it to you several times. Matthew 22, Matthew 24, Ephesians chapter uh, 5 and 6. And now here it is in Revelation chapter 18 and 19. But what follows the destruction of Mystery Babylon? When we read on down, and I'm not going to read all the verses because I simply am running out of time. But in verse 7, he says, let us be glad and rejoice. And give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed or clothed, now watch, in fine linen. That was the material, those were the materials of the tabernacle, the fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But the fine linen represented the high priest uh, garments who went into the holy of holies. And so this is what we have. It's the time of the marriage, and therefore it followed the destruction of the city. That theme and motif runs through every major text that talks about the marriage. It is the destruction of the city, and that is followed by, uh, by the marriage, and it was only 40 years for that to take place. And the last one we mentioned is in chapter 21 where it says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth has pa had passed away and there was no more sea. All right, there's the end of the old temple. There's the end of the old city of Jerusalem. But what happens after that? John says, then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with them, or is with men, and I will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Here again, the destruction of the city, and then you have the consummation of the marriage, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, the bride coming down out of heaven from God. There was one that I forgot because I was rushing, and that is in Galatians chapter 4. If you read Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31, you see where the text talks about Abraham having two sons, and the one born after the flesh, which was Hagar in Mount Sinai, that answered to the Jerusalem that now is. So there was the Jerusalem, the old Jerusalem. But then you had the Jerusalem who was above, which was the holy city, the new one that we just talked about. And it was upon the destruction of that city that brought about the marriage of the new, and therefore uh, the consummation of those things uh, that relates to the marriage. Well, I'm going to end it there and point out simply that tie-in to the Exodus in terms of the wedding. The wedding was at the time of the Parisian. No one can deny that. But the wedding was the Exodus motif. 
and therefore the parousia in first Corinthians 15 is the exodus motif but the wedding follows the destruction of the city and that city was the destruction of jerusalem and therefore the resurrection of first Corinthians 15 must follow the destruction of the city of jerusalem in 70 a.d it cannot be uh, in any wise forced into a future uh, concept unless we're going to regurgitate and somehow recreate the destruction of the city by the Romans. They already tried to do it with the temple, but it cannot be done. With that, uh, that's the message this morning. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope that the lesson was clear and that you got it, but that was a part of the foundation that needed to be laid so that we can see the overall framework of 1 Corinthians 15 before we jump in and start trying to talk about a body here and a body there and a body everywhere. Uh, we need to see the framework, and the framework will help us to identify why they're saying what they're saying and what those passages mean and why there's an interrelationship between the sowing and the city, et cetera, uh, as we've been pointing out and the time frame for all of that. With that, I want you to say have a good morning, and uh, we will see you next week, Lord willing, in our next broadcast. Uh, may God bless you all.